Hello and welcome to Man's Model Moments. With the recent release announcements from many of the manufacturers, and my video looking at what Airfix could do to improve, it got me thinking about all the different good and bad things that companies do. That train of thought extended further and got me on to try to work out which is the best model manufacturer in the world today. So that's what I'm going to attempt to do using science. This is no small undertaking of course, since there are a plethora of manufacturers right now. Doing some research, I believe taking 100 of the most currently active companies gives us sufficient scope so as to not leave any stone uncovered and not present any personal bias into the analysis. Now of course there are manufacturers that didn't make this cut, to which you may think, well, why isn't Das Werk or whatever other company included here? Well quite simply, I looked at the companies that have been most active in the 21st century, and if a small up-and-coming company isn't included here, it probably means that they haven't done enough yet to make it into that top 100. So they're certainly not going to then be the best company in the world. That does of course bring up the question as to what makes a company the best, and I'll cover that in each of the rounds as we get to them today. I should also say that with so much to consider, this is going to be a two-part video pairing that initial list down to just 12 finalists in this video, and then deep diving into those in part two to come up with our winner. So without further ado, here are those 100 companies representing three regions and almost 20 individual countries. We're going to start with Asia, for no other reason than it happens to be first alphabetically. This is where the Japanese took hold of modeling in the 1960s to become the global dominant force until recent decades. Firstly though, we're going to look at entrance in the list from a more recent competitor in the market, which is China. We'll start off here with Anagrand Craftwork, based out of Hong Kong, now once again under Chinese control of course. Next are Bronco and Dragon, before Kinetic, who are also based out of Hong Kong. Meng Model and Ryfield Model will be familiar to armor modelers, though SS Model are probably less recognizable. Tacom is next. And then we close out the Chinese manufacturers with the three brands under Zhongshan Yatai, that is Trumpeter, Hobby Boss, and I Love Kit. Moving to Japan, we have an enormous representation here, with more Japanese companies than any other country, from brands you will recognize to some much less well known. So to kick off, we have Aoshima, Ari, and Bandai, which also includes Bandai Spirits here, then into some more obscure names with B Club. Fairy Kikaku, F Toys, The Good Smile Company, Kyodo, Kami di Korokoro, and Kotobukiya. Fujimi and Hasegawa are much more recognizable, and many will also know Max Factory and Pit Road. Metalbox, Model Factory Hero, Sankai, and Studio 27, however, are unlikely to be familiar to many in the West, unlike the very well known Tamiya. Tomitech may be familiar to model railway builders but Volks Inc. and Wave Corporation may be less so. Our Asian contingent is then rounded up with Triglav Model from Singapore, Academy from South Korea, and finally AFV Club from Taiwan. That brings us to Europe, who make up the largest global group here, and also the most diverse in terms of geographical spread. It may be surprising then, but the first 12 entrants here are all from the Czech Republic, and they include names both familiar and obscure. Edward and Special Hobby are recognisable by most modellers, though AZ Model, Bren Gun, Cora Models, KP and Planet Models might leave some guessing. Even more obscure are CMR, LF Models, Mark I Models, MMK and RS Models. How many of these do you know? Finland is next, with Mester R. Mallet. And then we have six entries from France. Obviously we have the very well-known Heller, but also De Kit, Larsnel, Provence Moulage, and the amusingly logoed Shark Kit. Now I have included Georgia here in Europe, as well as Russia, which is a bit of a stretch, as they do bridge between Asia and Europe, but in any case, they're represented here by W Model. Next up is Germany, with three entries you've probably not heard of, Bird Models, Germania Figuren, and Model Trans Model Bau. Plus one everybody of course has, the big hitter Ravel. 
Next are two countries using the same colours for their flags. First off is Hungary, with Armada Hobby and OKB Grigorov. Second is Italy, starting off with another heavy hitter in Italieri, supported by Racing 43, Tomeo Kits and WIP3D. Poland brings us eight entrants, starting with Arno, Big Model, Cherosi Model Bud and Hobby 2000, before the more recognisable Mini Art and MPM. Red Tank Miniature, and for me, the unpronounceable firm I'll refer to as WAK, finish up their entries. Turning further east to Russia, we have another mix of unknown and familiar, with AVD models and Combrig starting us off, then Eastern Express, and of course the very well known Svesta. To finish our European entries, then, we turn to Spain with a single entrant of FC Model Trend. Ukraine is our penultimate entry with seven manufacturers. 8 if you include Miniart, which is now of course located in Poland. You've probably been living under a rock if you haven't heard about them and ICM, and many will also be familiar with Dora Wings, Rodan, A-Model, and possibly even Micromere too. Ace and Unicraft, however, are probably a little more out of most modellers' scope. And then finally to the UK. Here we start with Accurate Armour, the less familiar aircraft in miniature, and then names that are well known to modellers and lay people alike, Airfix and Games Workshop. Our last region is North America, where the hobby really began in earnest, and we have just a single country, which for many of us is synonymous with the region anyway, and that is the USA. Here we have nine entrants, the well-known AMT stroke Ertl, Atlantis, a company that I desperately want to say is dumbass, but is probably not, Fantastic Plastic, and Fascinations. We then have the upcoming Mobius models, the refreshed MPC, and then two smaller manufacturers, Tiger Productions and XP Forge. So now we have our contenders, how are we going to pare them down? Well, the first condition I'm going to apply is that they need to be making injection molded styrene kits. There are a couple of reasons for this, and they're similar to why most mainstream companies don't generally make 3D printed parts for kits themselves. Cost, and scale. If a company makes a production run of say 5,000 kits and they have to 3D print it, that's going to take a lot of time. 3D printing an entire kit is probably going to require a dedicated print run, so that's 5,000 prints. Let's assume we're printing a 172nd scale tank and we have a fast print time of just two hours, then we have 10,000 hours of print time. Assuming a generous 10% failure rate, we get 11,000 hours, or 1,374 days of printing 8 hours per day. Again, let's be generous and add just 5% time for print switchovers and a 5 day work week. That's 290 weeks of printing on a single machine, or 6 years, give or take, with holidays and other downtime. Multiple machines of course help. So 10 machines reduce that down to 30 weeks, and bigger machines might allow more prints per run. Let's say 5 per 1 machine, and we have 6 weeks of printing for those 5,000 kits. This is just the printing. You will also need to wash and cure those prints, adding more time and more machines. We'll work on the same 10 large stations. So 30 minutes of washing, 15 minutes of curing, 15 minutes of changeover, so an additional 2 weeks of work time or two months in total. Now cost. You have to of course buy those 10 printers, and if we are going for a large, high quality machine like the Frozen Mega 8K for instance, that's about £2,300 per machine, or £23,000 investment in production up front. You need your washing stations, which are cheaper at about £350 per machine, and curing stations at about £500, or in total about another £8,500, bring our initial cost of investment to about £32,000. More expensive than that though are the specialised employees and production areas you need to house the machines and run them. This can't just be a warehouse since resin printing needs stable, warm conditions and you require adequate ventilation to comply with health and safety. You need electricity, probably with UPS or a backup generator to ensure a stable supply, and then you need the resin to feed them. A lot of it. That means storage of the said resin, which again is going to have to be specialised to satisfy health and safety regulations. 
you need a lot of solvent to wash the resin as well, liters per run, so over a thousand gallons, which also needs specialized disposal after use, which needs to be paid for. The ongoing consumable costs remain high, and production times are pretty much constant. LCD screens and printers only last for about 2,000 hours or so, so that also needs to be factored into lifetime production costs. All of that, of course, needs to be recouped in the kit, which will make it more expensive. After all that, not every modeler is familiar with or wants to use resin, so you've limited your potential market. 3D parts need cleanup just like injection molded parts, and resin dust is nasty, so you need to warn people and restrict sales to experienced modelers, removing younger modelers as a market. Similar restrictions apply to metal and other polymers, but 3D printing just illustrates the point. On the flip side, injection molding takes about a minute to produce a frame. And since we've talked about a simple kit here, let's assume we can accommodate everything we need on one frame, or two smaller ones that will be injected at the same time. Allowing 10% time for ejection and resetting, it will take just one injection molding machine about 10 days or two weeks of eight hours per day working to make those same 5,000 kits in polystyrene, with no further cleanup, no waste disposal, and a much lower consumable cost. The upfront costs are probably similar, but it's a one-off with no maintenance, and as you use a company with machines as a service, which charges fees on a daily or per impression basis, your production costs are low and constant. Polystyrene is easy to work with, has no special handling considerations, and is recyclable, even if your local government doesn't choose to do that, meaning that you have access to the widest possible market. So in order to be the best scale model company in the world, you do need to be producing kits in injection molded plastic, as it gives the perfect balance of cost, detail, ease of use, as well as production time at ease. So applying that to our 100 contenders, and we immediately strip the field of a lot of companies making 3D printed or cast resin kits, kits in white metal, photo etch, or mixed media. Some of these companies do use some injection molding, but only in some kits and only as part of the kit, whereas those who pass here need to be making the majority of their kits via injection molding. Now, almost half of our contenders don't make this cut, which is a testament to just how many small companies have recently entered the market to fill niches not covered by the more mainstream manufacturers. They might be making excellent kits, and they might have exactly the kit you're looking for, but what we're looking for here is the ability to supply the market, and not just a few select modelers. Having said that, I do suggest you check out some of the websites of these companies, because some of them are making some really interesting kits. That last point brings us to the next criteria, and that is breadth of range. It's no good for a company to be making excellent models that only serve a tiny proportion of modelers. They might be making the best World War I aircraft in the world, but that doesn't make them the greatest scale model company in the world to anyone outside of that niche. Now, in order to be considered the best, I think you need to be addressing the widest possible available market, and in this case, appealing to the broadest proportion of modelers. Now, it's difficult to properly assess that market since there is no census data on modeling needs, but what we can do is look at the number of models produced for different areas, which gives us a broad brush idea of what subjects modelers actually buy. This gives us proportions of 37% aircraft, 21% military vehicles, 19% civilian vehicles, 11% naval, and 12% sci-fi space and other. Using the 80-20 rule, we can say that in order to qualify for round three, they need to be addressing at least 80% of this market. It doesn't matter what mix, just that they address 80% or more, which shows that the company needs to be making both aircraft and military vehicles as a minimum, as they make up over half of the market. Now this actually removes some of the biggest companies in the hobby, including the largest Games Workshop, since they are very monopurpose to their own game. Other manufacturers we tend not to think of as scale model manufacturers here in the West, like Bandai, also fail here for the same reason. Some more recognisable and very well thought of companies also fall by the wayside here. Not because they don't make excellent models, but because they are solely focused on one or two subject areas. 
Accurate Armor, Dora Wings, Ryfield Model, Kinetic, these are all dedicated to a limited range, which in itself shows dedication, but it limits their market opportunity and hence broad appeal. For a model company to be considered the best, it needs to be agreed on by the widest possible group. So after round two, we have 23 companies left to consider. Let's see how we get down to those 12 finalists. For this round, I've looked at companies' activity during the 21st century, and especially the last five years. Making an amazing set of models and then sitting back isn't enough in today's market, if indeed it ever was. Innovation and investment in the business, creating new products, and being active are all signs of a good company that's doing well. Fortunately for us, this is pretty easy to measure with model companies, since producing new tools is a very clear sign of how companies are, or aren't, investing money. Here I've looked at how many new tools, on average, a company has made each year for every decade of the 21st century. Only those making, on average, six or more new tools per year, which is one every two months, make the grade. This actually cuts out some pretty significant companies. The first of these I'll talk about is Heller. This is a company that's been in decline for a long time, and it shows in the data. At the turn of the century, Heller was making just under five new tools per year, but that dropped to just over one per year in the 2010s, and they've done nothing new in the 2020s. We'll see if this changes in their future, but right now they're not even close to making the grade. The next one, which really surprised me, is Fujimi. Like Hella, they were putting out about five tools per year in the noughties, and this shot to 26 per year in the 2010s. Sadly, that has fallen off a cliff, with just three per year being produced since 2020. Italieri was my next surprise, with a gradual decline from 12 to 10 to just four tools per year over the course of the last quarter century. I didn't really expect they'd come out on top, but I did think they'd make the final, but not this time. Now, I didn't really expect Dragon to have made it this far, if I'm honest, but they have a similar profile to Italieri, just with a steeper decline. There are also a number of smaller manufacturers that didn't quite make it, which show similar profiles. Edouard, AFB Club, Cora Models, and Fine Molds. The numbers show that they're growing steadily at a fairly constant rate, which is great, but I don't think it brings them into the same league as our finalists. I think some of these could creep up to make that transition in coming years, particularly if some of the finalists drop off a little, and I'll talk about that more in a second. Hobby 2000 and Ari I included here by way of cautionary tales with data. Both made no investment in new tools. That's because Ari actually went out of business in the early 2000s, and Hobby 2000 mainly rebox other companies' kits. If you're searching for models or doing research like this, Scalemates is a fantastic resource, but do double check what the data is telling you. Just by reading raw data, Ari got through to round three, but it's no longer trading. Scalemates won't tell you that unless you check its brand page, despite the fact that most experienced modelers already know that. Likewise, Hobby 2000 look great on paper, but filtering by new tools shows they don't really make anything themselves. So yes, maybe two more manufacturers should have been on this list instead of these two, but I think that their inclusion is more informative than two more small manufacturers that would have fallen at round two. So here are our 12 finalists. By round three reckoning, Zhang Chang Yatai, Trumpeter, Hobby Boss and I Love Kit, are leading with an astonishing average of 47 new tools per year which really hasn't changed over the past 25 years. Next is Tamiya, with an average of 23, which again has been pretty consistent. In third place is another surprise for me, Tacom. I didn't expect this, but it has had an explosive growth over the past decade, to an average of 18 new tools per year. Another surprise for me was Vesta, with a solid growth over this time to an average of 17 new tools per year. Meng Model is next, with a similar rapid growth to Tacom, and then ICM, which has a similar profile to Zvesta. 
Hasegawa then comes in with a pretty constant level of around 11 tools per year. Airfix follows them, and it shows the investment that Hornby and Phoenix have put in over the past decade, with around 10 tools per year. Aoshima follows them with a similar level of new tooling, though this was slightly higher earlier in the century. To Revell, which I think is one of the companies most at risk in falling out of this list, because they have made 7 new tools per year, but that has massively decreased from what they were doing. Academy, who average 7 new tools per year, and that is pretty constant. The other company at risk of falling out of the finalists in future is our last finalist, Special Hobby. They do make on average 6 new tools per year in the 2020s, but that was much higher in the 2000s. In any case, the future is another matter. We have our 12 companies that we'll get into much more detail in the next video, and I'll really drill down to find out that one company that rises above all the rest. Who do you think it will be? The juggernaut of Zhongshan Yatai? Or one of the other rapidly expanding Chinese companies? Maybe the stability of the Japanese companies Tamiya, Hasegawa, or Ayoshima? Will it be one of the old guard, Airfix or Revell, or maybe Eastern Europe in the form of ICM or Zvezda? Will a smaller company like Academy or Special Hobby upset the apple cart with a surprise victory? Let me know what you predict and why you think they'll be the winner. Or if you have any other thoughts about these rounds, how I've chosen them, how I've executed them, please write them in the comments of the video down below. If you're not already, I would really appreciate your subscription to the channel and make sure you have the notification bell set to all so you don't miss the conclusion to this video when it's published. That's all for this instalment of Man's Model Moments. If you enjoyed the video, please click the like button, subscribe to the channel for more like it, and share this video with others you think would also enjoy it. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook, and if you're feeling generous then I also have a Patreon, which is absolutely the best way of helping me to grow the channel and produce more content like this. With that, I hope you have plenty of modelling moments of your own, and I look forward to welcoming you on the next video.